I'm honored, but also humbled at the thought of being nominated for the prestigious Private Practice Lawyer of the Year Award in the company of many of the leading lawyers in Southeast Asia. But I'm particularly thrilled that my team has also been recognized in the category of International Arbitration Team of the Year. While the Private Practice Lawyer of the Year Award category honors individuals, those practicing in law firms cannot succeed without a strong team around them. Individual technical skills only take you so far. A strong collegiate team effectively has a multiplier effect, expanding the range and the quality of the work that can be taken on. So having the right team is essential to success in a law firm. Deckett started in Philadelphia in 1875 and celebrates its 146th anniversary this year. It is headquartered in New York and Philadelphia today and has 22 offices around the world, including in Beijing, Hong Kong, and Singapore here in Asia. Myself, I'm also from the Asia Pacific, having uh, studied and qualified first in Australia before completing an LLM at the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom in 2001. And I've effectively been overseas practicing international arbitration ever since, working in Paris, London, Hong Kong, and most recently in Singapore. Well, first of all, we are innovative. We have had something of a startup attitude from day one of the commencement of the Singapore arbitration practice back in early 2015. We've been inspired and not overawed by the challenges that we have faced in building the practice over the last six and a half years. That innovative approach has extended to thought leadership, including uh, writing the very first book on SIAC arbitration, a guide to the SIAC arbitration rules, published by Oxford University Press, which is now one of the leading authorities uh, in the area. Secondly, uh, we've pursued uh, new and evolving areas such as third-party funding. We did one of the very first third-party funded cases uh, in Asia and, and as a result was awarded um, or was commended by the FT and its Innovative Lawyer Awards a couple of years ago. We've also sought to pursue and confront new and evolving issues uh, as, they are, as they appear and, and apply to Asia, including the spread of uh, toxic haze across uh, much of Southeast Asia some years ago and the tensions within the South China Sea, we've sought to address those issues to make a contribution as to how they should be resolved um, in the interests of, of, of those operating in the region. Uh, secondly, beyond being innovative, we also seek to be commercial. We focus on the needs of clients uh, rather than necessarily, for instance, uh, explaining to clients everything that we've learned about a particular issue. We, we focus on what they need to know so that the, the advice is digestible and usable immediately by the client, rather than them having to weigh through uh, many, many pages of analysis. Uh, that, of course, can be provided, but often clients want to know the answer, not how you got to that answer. And we seek to focus on that conclusion rather than the process for the benefit of our clients. And we combine that commercial approach to our advice with flexibility with our fees, including embracing alternative fee arrangements. And we combine both the innovative attitude and the commercial attitude with excellence in advocacy so that we can persuade clients uh, to adopt and accept the positions of our clients, often in, in matters that are finely balanced, our advocacy can often make the difference. see commercial arbitration growing considerably over the next 12 months and beyond, fueled by contingency fees as that becomes legalized in Singapore and Hong Kong. I think this is very much an area that we should be watching out for uh, as the parliaments in both those countries look to legalize contingency fees, and that should lead to a surge in cases and, and cases that previously may not have been pursued effectively being unlocked by the ability of law firms like our own to do the, to do the cases on a contingency basis. Secondly. I see decarbonisation disputes becoming quite prominent over the years to come. 
and and when I talk about decarbonisation disputes, I'm referring to both those that relate to uh, fossil fuel energy, as that gets disrupted by emerging uh, forms of energy, as well as disputes arising in the context of renewable energy and the emerging markets that we're starting to see, such as uh, the, the, the new market that's been developing for uh, voluntary carbon offset credits, uh, which is given that it's new and innovative and, and foreign to many, that's likely to lead to disputes into the future. Well, the change has been forced upon us by the pandemic. Um, we have not been able to travel to visit clients uh, since last April. And as a consequence of travel being eliminated, uh, we've been forced to work remotely, which in turn has saved clients' costs. It has also unlocked resources around our network of offices that are now available uh, to our clients. We're no longer, no longer constrained by the, the size of our teams within any one office, but we can access those resources wherever they may be. Of course, we could have done that in the past, but now I think there's a greater acceptance that it doesn't matter where people are, as long as the right people are, are engaged on a matter and we can access uh, all of our lawyers across our network to the benefit of our clients. Yes, technology impacts on client relations significantly. Uh, first of all, it provides greater accessibility. Um, we are available um, at any time and through any means uh, these days, including through uh, video conferencing. And from our perspective, it enables us to see and speak to more clients. No longer is time wasted or energy lost in travel, um, but we can simply switch from one video call to another, thereby allowing us to speak to more clients more often than what we previously did. Yes, a client was faced with a billion dollar claim a couple of years ago that if successful, would have led to even more claims being, being brought against it, uh, as well as a surge of cases generally within the industry in which it operates. We devised an innovative strategy of challenging the admissibility of the claim which the tribunal ultimately accepted, thus knocking out a high value claim early with minimal cost and with enormous consequences for the client and the entire industry. Yes, stability is important in the sense that clients want to know that you and the team will be around to see the case through to its conclusion, which in the context of international arbitration can take many years. Secondly, they also want to know that there is sufficient depth within the team to be able to handle their case. So they look to see the strength of the associates and how they're performing in order to be comfortable uh, that they've retained the right team. And that's one of the reasons why I'm very thrilled that we have been nominated for the award of International Arbitration Team of the Year in Southeast Asia, because uh, depth of, of, of the team is very important to many of our clients. Secondly, in terms of strategic direction, that is also something of great importance to our clients. Almost all our cases are decided based on strategy and its execution. Indeed, if the answer to a problem were simple, it probably wouldn't be elevated to arbitration. And if it was, it would probably settle early. Clients tend to come to us precisely because the issue is complex and the arguments are finely balanced. In that context, strategy can mean the difference between winning and losing and therefore is of utmost importance for our clients. Young aspiring lawyers may be surprised by this advice, but it is this, be generous with your time and your advice, because that is essential to building relationships. One has to take a long-term view as to uh, what is needed to build relationships that might ultimately one day translate into instructions for, for major cases. And I think the starting point for that process is to be generous with your time and with your advice so that you, so the clients can start to see uh, your qualities and appreciate uh, your views and your perspectives. And ultimately, so you can gain their trust and confidence, which ultimately then can translate into instructions uh, um, at, at a later time.
I think there are three things one could look at. The first is the most obvious, which is the profile uh, of the lawyers and, and the team that they've constituted to see to what extent it is sufficiently diverse. One could also go beyond that and consider to what extent senior management and leadership are also reflecting uh, the diverse nature of society. Secondly, one could consider the extent to which a law firm has pursued substantive causes in an effort to ensure that society is a fairer and more diverse place. In that context, I'm pleased to say that last year we demonstrated that arbitration can be a force for improving diversity within society. And in particular, we uh, acted in a case largely on a pro bono basis for a, for a sports official here in Asia and established an important precedent in gender equality in Asian sports governance. Thirdly, clients can consider linking the remuneration of their counsel to their, their achievement of diverse and ESG goals more generally. Just like many executives within companies are today having their remuneration linked to the extent to which they achieve uh, diverse and ESG goals, lawyers can also have their remuneration linked to the extent to which they are satisfying uh, their aspirations to be diverse and to ensure that uh, ESG policies are being achieved. Well, I'm not quite sure where the firm will develop in the future more generally, but I can answer that from the perspective of the arbitration profession. And I think, as I've already mentioned, that decarbonisation presents a massive opportunity for the arbitration profession in general, uh, and in particular here in Asia. And I say that on, on two bases. First, substantively, I think we as a profession can assist clients in old, new and emerging industries to adapt to the changes that they're experiencing and to help them resolve disputes um, on, on the path to decarbonisation. Secondly, we as a, as a profession can take steps to reduce, if not eliminate, the carbon footprint of international arbitration so as to align the practice of arbitration with the journey to net zero that our clients are on.